In this next session, we have three incredible speakers. And the first of those is Joseph Mbaiwa, who is the professor. Joseph Mbaiwa is the director of the Okavango Research Institute and a professor of tourism studies at the University of Botswana. Joseph. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming, and thanks, David, for the invitation. Uh, apparently, yesterday, uh, when I flew from Botswana, I was asking myself whether I will arrive. Uh, I realized that I also have those, uh, uh, those uh, what do you call them, uh, those uh, perceptions about so many aeroplanes uh, uh, collapsing or, you know, all those, uh, yeah, what happened to Ethiopian Airways? So when I landed in the UK, I was like, oh, thanks God I'm still alive. <laughs> Otherwise, thank you very much. I'm going to talk to you about uh, this subject of uh, economic development, tourism, and conservation. This is actually one of the key uh, subjects not only in Africa, but I think in the developing world at large. But first, when we talk of tourism, I think you will agree with me that uh, tourism is recognized by many governments as one of the key economic sectors in the country, mainly because of the jobs, the exports, and the investment that go with tourism. So in that regard, really, most governments want tourism to be promoted in their countries. However, when we look at tourism, I think we should not forget the north-south debate uh, for the simple reason that um, when it comes to issues of conservation, conservation has become one of those key concepts around the world. And much of the conservation, much of the biodiversity remains in the developing world, that is uh, in the south. So when you talk of conservation, it is somehow a contentious you know, debate, contentious engagement between the North and the South. And in most cases, it is the North that uh, usually proposes some of uh, the approaches and strategies to approach conservation or biodiversity in the form of laws, in the form of protocols, in the form of what? And um, the South, in most cases, we expect the South to, to respond to that, to rectify the uh, protocols, to rectify the, 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 the agreements and the like. I'll just mention one of the, 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 the greatest summits we ever had uh, in the world. That is the Rio Summit of 1992. I think we all know that uh, the global world actually gathered in Rio uh, to talk about conservation. At this point in time, uh, biodiversity was actually one of the key subject areas at this uh, summit. And for biodiversity to survive, the question was, these guys need to respond. Either uh, they commercialize biodiversity, biodiversity one or the other was seen as a, an economic uh, product. And uh, whether the commercialization of biodiversity is good or bad is for us to, to look at it and uh, try and understand and respond accordingly. Governments from the Rio summit, they had to respond to this. And most governments in the developing world had to commercialize biodiversity for biodiversity to be included in their uh, in their laws. And tourism was one approach in which biodiversity became commercialized. <clears throat> Governments in developing countries actually encourage tourism because it has that potential to promote the national and regional economies. Wildlife-based tourism is actually one of the most economic activities or economic sectors in the developing world. You speak of Botswana, for example, uh, 
tourism is the second largest economic sector in the country after diamond mining. So wildlife in most, most of the time is perceived as that tourism product which has to be sold to tourists, international tourists. For, and those people who are living in wildlife areas are seen or are perceived to be beneficiaries of this tourism development. Wildlife-based tourism is actually a key, or it's a pillar of most economies in East and Southern Africa. You talk of Kenya, you talk of Tanzania, you talk of Botswana, you talk of Uganda, you'll realize that uh, uh, wildlife-based tourism in those countries is very, very important in the sense that it is generating this uh, revenue, foreign exchange, and uh, a number of people are employed in it, so tourism is perceived as this sector which is alleviating poverty in, the, in East and Southern Africa. Tourism is perceived as one of those uh, sectors which are actually contributing to the sustainable development goals. That is conservation as well as poverty alleviation. alleviation. <clears throat> I've already mentioned to you that in Botswana, uh, it is the second largest economic sector in the country. You look at the green colors there. These are protected areas. 17% of Botswana's uh, surface area is protected area. That is, say, national parks and game reserves. And an additional 22 has been designated as wildlife management areas. So in reality, we are talking of about 40% of the country being reserved for wildlife conservation. In this regard, this actually shows you that Botswana values wildlife for the simple reason that wildlife is a tourism product. I don't know whether, if at all there was no tourism, uh, much of this land would be reserved for, for wildlife. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a question for another day. And you look at this 22% that I'm talking about, which is outside protected areas. That's where you will find a lot of community-based tourism projects. So briefly, let us look at some of the economic benefits which communities are deriving from the wildlife in their areas. Namibia, they have what they call conservancies. These are areas outside protected areas. And in these areas, there are a lot of uh, wildlife and communities are actually um, benefiting uh, from the wildlife outside protected areas by coming up with pro, uh, projects. They, they could be uh, lodges, they could be end activities, game drives and the like. And they generate huge sums of money out of it. I'm told in Namibia they have almost over 60, 60 64 of such uh, projects which are outside community, I mean outside protected areas. The same applies to Uganda when it comes to the gorillas. They do have a lot of uh, um, communities benefiting from this gorilla tourism. Speak of India again, told I've never been to India myself, but I'm told uh, communities are actually benefiting from the tigers and you'll find that most of the community activities are around the, the parks. And I'm actually told that uh, even outside the protected areas, we do have those, uh, the tiger in those areas. And some communities in India, they've used their culture to benefit from, from uh, the tiger in the form of tourism. This again just shows you some of the case studies around around the world, Botswana, India, South Africa, Malawi, Kenya, Namibia, and Uganda, where communities are actually benefiting from wildlife, which is outside protected areas in the form of community projects. Back home in Botswana, we have our own famous Okavango Delta with all those species uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the wetland. And uh, the Okavango Delta with all these species has become an international Destination, tourism destination area. People come for a number of things, find swimming pools in the middle of uh, 
the bush and uh, after some game drive in the evening, people go out there to swim, right? And because of that, there has been a lot of economic benefits from this uh, uh, international tourist arriving in the area. Communities have taken advantage of that and uh, there is a, a lot of employment opportunities, kind of income generation, and a number of community-based projects. I know um, how much does much of the money that comes from tourism remains with these communities is also subject for another day. But what we are saying is, yes, communities are benefiting, but at the same time, uh, I'm saying how much they benefit from the tourism is a debate maybe for this evening at the panel discussion. These are some of the, the benefits which communities uh, uh, are deriving from the tourism in the Okavango. They get the benefits, they build themselves houses. Uh, you look at um, when I was doing my PhD, actually in one of the communities, this was the, the situation. Ten years later, I mean my master's MSc, Ten years later, when I came for my PhD, this was the situation, <coughs> right? Uh, communities have derived the money, and then they decided to use the money to improve their livelihoods. These are some of the communities have even gone further to establish their own community and lodges, accommodation facilities, where they directly get money from from the, the tourism industry. This is just a summary that shows some of the benefits, the money that they get from tourism, how this money uh, come to improve their livelihoods in as far as social services are concerned. They use the money as household evidence, use the money to pay for scholarship for their kids, use the money to build some of these facilities for the elderly, or the old people who cannot, or the needy, who cannot do those on their own, right? So what we are saying is, is that uh, because of tourism in this wildlife area, there has been some benefits which communities are deriving from it. Earlier speakers actually talked of a balance that needs to, that need to be maintained. If you want to make communities conserve the resources, you actually need to introduce an element of benefit. She actually talked of value, benefit, and then conservation. I think I like that slide which she, she showed. That was Alexandra, right? I like that slide, and that should be actually the key thing. If we want to achieve conservation around the world, we should look at the values of the people. We should look at how communities are benefiting, and if they benefit, we are likely to have conservation coming. But if you, 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 one is, is not included in that equation, we must forget about conservation. This is just to give maybe some highlights into if communities benefit, what actually happens when it comes to conservation. I'll give you the Namibian case study here. Um, you look at what they have in this slide in Namibia. There's hunting. I know hunting is a very contentious, uh, uh, very contentious to talk about, subject to talk about. Hunting in Namibia generates money and jobs. People benefit. It leads to toler tolerance to wildlife, encourages wildlife, protects wildlife, and wildlife numbers increases. Namibia, I'm told, the rhino population in that country was almost zero in 1990. But um, almost 20 years later, the rhino population had increased in Namibia. You look at the elephant population, this was, there were only 7,000, but last year they came to 28,000 for the simple reason that for communities outside the parks, they were allowed to benefit from, from, uh, from the wildlife. So this actually made them 
to conserve the resources. Just spoke of the rhino population, and we are told that Namibia has actually has actually has some of the largest uh, rhino population, you know, roaming in the in the wild out there. These are communities are the people who actually report to government uh, officials that uh, there are some suspicious guys coming from maybe Asia or so. Uh, they want to poach. So when they report, they become part and parcel of uh, the conservation effort. They report this to authorities and guys get arrested. But imagine if at all there were no benefits. They would actually assist the guys who are poaching to, to poach the wildlife. This is actually what is happening in Botswana. We don't have hunting at the moment in Botswana. We now have former community hunters actually helping these uh, gang gangsters coming from elsewhere to come and hunt in the country. So you don't want that situation. You want to bring the communities to be part and parcel of, uh, part and parcel of the conservation efforts. This just shows you some of the animals that we have in Botswana. We have those guys that we call community escort guides. These are the guys who are from the community areas who live with wildlife. You make them benefit, they will actually become the wildlife warders. They will actually police the area, provide protection to the animals uh, in the area. I've been stopped by these guys so many times while I'm driving. In, in these community areas, thinking that maybe I'm one of the poachers, stopped by the community escort guides. So we want communities to be involved in order to police their own areas. So these are some of the, the guys, the escort guys that I'm talking about, who are actually doing that in their concession areas or in their community area. They actually work hand in hand with government uh, uh, the Department of Wildlife and National Parks to assist in as far as conservation is concerned. There is a, a program which they call the MOMS, MOMS uh, project. Actually, these community guides, guides collect a lot of data, conservation data needed by wildlife, right? You, you involve the communities, they will help you in as far as data is concerned in their concession areas. One interesting thing is that if communities become involved in tourism uh, development, they, they, they form their own local institutions. So these local institutions will actually provide a direction in how conservation in the area and tourism in that particular concession area should be, should be done. They will be having their own board of trustees. They will be having their own you know, structures to manage uh, resources in their areas. So I'm talking about collective community efforts in conservation. It's very key. We cannot ignore that one. We need to bring in the communities to protect the wildlife in their areas. It is true, wildlife in most parts of the world, especially, especially in developing world, is on decline. It's on the decline mainly because of poaching and many other factors, natural factors like uh, droughts and the like. But what I'm saying is, if communities are not benefiting, the next thing you'll be having, you'll be having this. They will use uh, whatever means to get into wildlife areas and they will poach, they will kill, but you want to avoid this. I'm also saying we might put so much resources in the army, but I think in Africa they've proved not to be working. You may put a lot of the military into, into wildlife areas, but the whole idea, the military alone cannot succeed. They need to be working with communities for them to succeed. So in conclusion, what I'm trying to say to you is that uh, we need to look at uh, the, both the socio-economic and ecological frameworks and put them together in order to achieve uh, conservation. We need to, 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 to integrate 
all the strategies, bring in the military, bring in the communities, bring in the scientists to achieve conservation in, uh, in, uh, in Africa. The other thing that I want to say here is that uh, there is this misconception that uh, phototourism is the best conservation tool. Yes, I agree, but I'm saying you need to combine phototourism and hunting to some extent to achieve <coughs> conservation. And the, the, the way you should conduct your hunting should be such that you select certain species, not all of them. I will not recommend hunting for rhinos in Botswana, no, because we have only about 300, right? But you ask me, I will recommend the hunting of elephants because there are many, right? You do selective hunting, that one I will, I would, uh, I will, I will support it. And I will also say we need to do integrated land use planning so that we know what to do where, what activity needs to be done in which area. And we need to assist communities. There are so many approaches that we can use, so many models that we can use to help communities which are living outside protected areas to benefit from tourism and conserve the resources. These are just some of uh, the approaches which are there. Again, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, you know, conservation in the, in the developing world is a north-south uh, issue, and we need to find a balance. How do we do it? How are the north helping the south to promote conservation, right? So with those um, uh, few remarks, let me say thank you for listening. <laughs>